Welcome to Power of the Tribe podcast. I'm your host, John Connors. I'm also the founder and head instructor of Connors Martial Arts. We teach Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Muay Thai kickboxing, mixed martial arts. We will make your life much, much better. You'll be happier, a little bit happier. You'll feel much more fulfilled. You'll be challenged. You will lose inches off your waist. Your hormone levels will improve. Blood pressure is better. Your cholesterol will go down. Uh, you'll have a, a, a spring in your step. Life will be good. You'll be on the sunny side of the street. Uh, did I leave anything out, Dan? Yeah, probably. <laughs> and I'm here with my It'd co-host. Insane to not do it. Dan Robin, also known as Dr. Dan. We, yes. we haven't mentioned that for a while. The baddest mother effer in podcasting. Uh, with a doctorate. With a doctorate. And my new nickname for you, the Lord of the Manor. I'm I think good. that I'm suits glad. you well. I think we should go back to nicknames. I'm a <laughs> huge fan. How you doing? Uh, all right. I think I you know, got a little I think cranky you, lately. Down, down to like a seven out of ten. You're down to a seven. Yeah. Well, you're turning heads when you walked in here. Dimitri was uh, <laughs> eyeing you up like a leg of lamb, man. It's the benefit of the podcast, I'm telling you. <laughs> you I'm look fit. fit. Yeah. yeah. You're, you must have your pheromones are flying, man. You look uh, you look good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, I'm something like 12 pounds down, and I wasn't. That That's wasn't crazy. with like 60 pounds to lose. It was like with like 12 to lose, you know, so. That's fantastic. And it's from this podcast. So Can I ask you what you weighed in today? Yeah, it was 177 again. And remember, there was times I was getting, I was starting to kiss like 195. Yeah. You know what I mean? So oh, yeah. I wasn't, I, I'm not sure I ever really was 195, but I was like maybe with clothes on or shoes yeah. or so. I was getting close. I was. <laughs> yeah, you are. I definitely was. <laughs> yeah. So it's working. And also, just to be clear, it's not like this isn't like an infomercial. If it wasn't, working or like i wasn't losing you know what i mean i'm not like trying to sell a product you know what i mean it's sort of like it did you really, ever hear that story i, I really <laughs> listened to what we said on the podcast and, and you it did really it. worked yeah so good every i heard tom arnold was on uh, howard stern years ago and he had this story so he <laughs> he got he was with uh, roseanne barr he was married to her yeah and they were going to get paid 10 million dollars if they lost something like 12 pounds each right <laughs> and they got a million dollars up front, and they started the program. And uh, I think it was something like they were. I think it was Weight Watchers, and they were getting all that food. And they have little dessert foods you're supposed to eat right, too. Yeah. So they had like a bag of, um, I think like mini Oreos, and you're only supposed to have so many. And she was like chowing down bag after bag and he was and he was like arguing and fighting with her he's like we're not going to get the 10 million and she's like f you tom and he he takes his hand and he slams his hand down on the bag of mini oreos and makes it crushes them into dust and she flips out takes his kitchen sorts. knife oh. and stabs him stabs <laughs> him in the chest and he has to go to the er and then snorts the oreos <laughs> And somehow but, she didn't get in any trouble. Like he didn't yeah, make a big deal out of it. But he literally, she stabbed him in the chest. And then they couldn't lose the weight. And Weight Watchers said, you know what? Keep the million. You're out. We're out. So they got a million dollars because they ended up gaining 15 pounds each but also, on the but, weight loss. But, <laughs> weight Watch support. <laughs> but also think about, the, you know, it sounds like a joke to compare it to an addiction because, you know. Oh, but no. This no joke, I think yeah. it's sugar, really, right? And Sugar. It's a killer. And it's yeah. really, really, like I said, I would feel, and I'm not an addictive personality. I feel like I'm the opposite. Like I don't almost don't understand it or I don't, but like. You're very stable. But I would feel. And I think we've established you have alien DNA. But I would feel it. Like when I stop sugar. Yeah. I'd be like, I feel that craving. Like, or, or what I think I've said before on the podcast, what I notice is when I'd not have sugar and then like after or after a meal. Like even so, I was still eating sugar, but I didn't have any in the house. And I'd be like ripping open every cabinet and like looking for it, and just be like, "There's got to be something," you know, like desperate, like looking in the freezer. This happened and like recently a, to you? Uh, it's throughout my life, right? Like yeah. if you're just out, and then starting to think, and this is when I'd really notice it. I'd be like, I might get in the car and go to the store and like just get <laughs> cookies or something. You might and then head down a store twenty four. And then, but yeah. then always, then something would blink in my brain and be like, "You're not getting in the car." 
and go to the <laughs> go to the store just to get sugar. Like that's completely out of control. But it made me realize that I thought of it. You know, definitely. I've totally done the same thing. I've been in a house and <laughs> there's like a a box of pizza that the kids have eaten, and I know there's one or two slices left, yeah. and it starts calling me from the other room. John, we're here. It'll taste good, a little cold. That's fine. And uh, yeah, it's crazy. He's got like the drool coming out. Yeah. It's and ag- very addictive. And yeah. again, so we said, we just let off saying I've lost this weight and I'm doing good, but it ha- I haven't really been doing that much. All I stopped was, so I, st- this is how easy it is. And I understand there's different metabolisms. I think you mean simple. Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah, I, I think simple means not complicated. Easy implies requires no effort. And I think we've established it can be a lot of effort I think if you're it's, addicted. It's also sort of easy. So just to, <laughs> just like hear me out for a second. Okay. So it's like I cut, you know, so the idea is to cut sugar and carbs. Like, so just eat meat. I think fruit, you sh- you fruit could, vegetable, yeah. meat. Yeah. And I, but for most of this, I wasn't even eating. And then I didn't regulate how much I had at all. At all. Yeah. And with the meat, I was sort of like, it's not like I have to have the, it'd be like a sausages and do what I mean? Like not, and like. You uh, didn't even go with the grain fed pasture. No, it was like, so, or like chicken that had been in marinated. And then some of it was even like cold cuts for lunch. Like I'd have slabs. And I only looked at that recently. And I was like, these damn things have sugar in them. They do. Like, you know yeah. what I mean? Like I just feel like having a slab. They of, do. Most bacon has sugar in it as well. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, but I was eating that. Yeah. And then I wasn't even sticking to the diet for like weekends, weekends counting Friday. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, so it was basically like four days out of seven. You're on point. Uh, being roughly eating mm. certain foods that aren't that bad. Mm. So that's not, that's kind of easy, right? Like it was, and then shedding 15 pounds. Do you know what I mean? Or whatever, yeah. however much weight it is, yeah. you know? So it's sort of easy. Well, I would say once people get addicted and we're surrounded by this processed food, I think for a lot of people, it can be very hard. And I think individuals vary. So I think you're a very stable guy. Your nervous system's arranged a certain way. It probably is easier for you than most. I think for some people, it's really hard. and then for me, the calendar also kicked in, mm. which we've said before, just putting the X's on the calendar. Yeah. Because I'd have whole weeks, even since this started, an entire mm. week where I couldn't write an X. Because I'm also being pretty fair about it. Where You're not BSing yourself. Yeah. that's. I think that's a good part of it, too. You can't be like, that's oh, essential. I only had one Snickers bar. That counts today. You know what I mean? Like, you have to be like... So I've been hard on myself that way. I'm like, I didn't do it today because of one thing. Damn, but these poor yeah. people, now that you've mentioned Snickers, they have the whole, you know, military industrial complex yeah. assaulting them. To, they have these commercials with Snickers that they're basically implying that Snickers are health, healthy for you. Yeah. Like if you don't eat your Snickers, you're going to be cranky. Well, the reason why they're cranky is their blood sugar is yeah. whacked <laughs> because they've been eating Snicker bars, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, do you want to be this mean old man or do you want to be this young cool guy? Like, yeah. That's the whole ad. It's very effective. <laughs> that's terrible, yeah. But I sort of like the idea of like it doesn't – because I want also people that are thinking about it, if, if there are people out there thinking about it, it doesn't even – it can be too daunting to be like, are you saying never have pasta? Oh, are I you hear you're saying. Are you saying never have another Snickers? I love Snickers bar. I love pasta. But I'm like, I'm having it three days a week. I think you, you know make I mean? a good like, point. I think you make a very good point where you do not have to be perfect. And sometimes the notion of perfection is overwhelming and people won't even start if they're like, if that's if this yeah. is the way it has to be. I'll just get fat. You hear people say it. that, right? Yeah. I'll just be overweight because I'm not doing that. Right. It's like, no, you, or even the they cheat. They make a political statement out of it's it. The too, I, you know? Yeah, it's yeah. the idea of the cheat day, but the cheat day doesn't quite do it because it's like, are you telling me no? Like it can be Monday and you're like, you're telling me no sugar or pasta or anything for sure until next Sunday. You know, if you're mm. cheat day Sunday, and then you're like that, I can't bear it. I but think this idea of the calendar too, you're like, I could break it any of these mm. days, 
but I'm just sort of still watching this calendar. And like, and if I keep breaking it and breaking it, then it's going to start bugging me. And I think, I mean, you have a pretty strict calendar and I have all the respect in the world for that. But if an individual out there could say, my calendar is going to be, I'm only going to drink water, no soft drinks, no fruit juices. And if a person who was used to drinking uh, soda and soft drinks did that, I think they would have a big beneficial impact just doing that, just getting that liquid sugar out of their diet. That that would probably help them get fitter and healthier and lose weight faster than anything else if that's part of their current yeah. diet. And then it can be overwhelming because you hear like, and it's, even if it's true, you hear, just just take out the soda. And you go, oh, you know what? Just take out the sugar. Just take out the, and and it's too much input. I used to have that too. Where I'm like, well, yeah. which one thing? Just Just control your breakfast. Just don't have carbs at breakfast. And then it becomes, well, which one of these things am I supposed to do? Or like, look, just just go on intermittent fasting or just and then it's like well there's there's so many things How's so all i'd say is at least Dan? pick one what's that how are your ketones uh, i don't know <laughs> pick one thing yeah definitely pick one to start out start out with one and definitely. put up that calendar and definitely. then you can just feel like i want to change it you know i can add something to the cat you can always add it but just do one thing do one thing start get some momentum and uh yeah, because it, it takes, a, like we, we said, it takes a couple few weeks for the, for your results to kick in. So And even now, like we said, like uh, also we're sort of pressuring each other, like you and I have been saying where our weight's at on and off. You were 177 like, today? Yeah. I was 176.2, Dan. Uh, <laughs> Touche. Yeah, well, who knows? There's, <laughs> there's error in these scales. But like, but I also... Um, but there's some pressure. I like sort of that back and forth. Yeah, I've been texting little, you the last few days. I, don't I like wa- it. I don't want to text you and be like, yeah, I'm fat as hell. You know, like it's good. It, it's some added pressure. Good, so beneficial social pressure, but, right? But so you've seen there's days, yesterday was a day where I'm like, I just, for the first time, like in a month, I went up in weight for no reason. Like I, I had a good day oh, right. where I did nothing and I went up like half a pound. I'm like, I, I, you know, that usually doesn't happen. But then it just corrects, like so. We right, said some that of that's hydration. You might have been slightly dehydrated the day before, yeah. Yeah. and it brings us to our, I think our deepest point we've made on all this, which is all about process. Like mm. it's not about that weight per se. You know what I mean? Like if I'm, if it's like I want to get to 177 pounds, that's wrongheaded. I'm just sort of like, I'm gonna just do this. I'm gonna change I, my diet, and the weight can fall where it may. And I'm going to keep doing it, period. Process. Yeah. I love it. I think we should change the name of this podcast to Power of the Process. We probably should. Can we do that, Dimitri? Is that possible? We'll keep the same logo. <laughs> but process is such a boring word, right? It's, we we, we have like with maybe computers instead of those uh, spears. I don't know. I totally agree with you, Dan. We were talking, you and I, off the air a week or two ago. I think you were talking about identity. I think it was off the air, and oh, it might have been on the air. And you said, "I don't think it's we got. You got to have to be careful with giving yourself too fixed an identity." Yeah. And I think this is, goes hand in hand with that. I'm thinking process is so important that I I even want to think about myself as not being something but becoming something. I am in process. You know. Right. I I am not a master's world champion i'm becoming a master's world champion and that's going to inform my actions and my behavior and it's going to necessarily be imperfect because we're human but right. it's process and, I, and i'm trying to get better i'm going to have i'm going to backslide and recover learn and get better i think um i like what do you think about that idea absolutely yeah and i think uh you know so a lot of the audience is jujitsu uh, practitioners and I mm-hmm. think it's very helpful they're not like mm. so everyone's already heard that you shouldn't go for brown belt or black belt or I want to be one of these things but this is more nuanced I think which is not only should you not have that goal you should reorient it in your head to like I want to be a guy who does jujitsu or girl who does jujitsu you want to be a girl who does jujitsu I want to be a girl who does jujitsu <laughs> Which is attainable. You could do that today. There'll be some sacrifice involved, but <laughs> I think that's my best hope for a world championship, for one thing. 
But the um, have you seen Gabby Garcia? Uh, yeah, <laughs> but now I'm below her weight class, I think. <laughs> but the uh, you know what I mean? Like I want to be someone who does jujitsu, and sort of forget, like throw away, like how how throw away sort of the external goals in a way, in a way. Like this is what we said. This is the the dance where you want to have goals that drive you, but you mostly want to be motivated by. I'm someone who does this. And then so if you backslide or you don't, it's just something that's happening. I completely it's not agree. like now I have to quit because I'm not on a pace to get to where I wanted. It's like I just want to do this, so I'm going to do it. The goal gives you the direction, but it's yeah. all about moving in in a direction. Right. And uh I've my jiu-jitsu has been experiences have been so much better than if I can embrace this and I try to do it every day. I try to go to my academy and be a professor an instructor and a student at the same time and i love being a student in my own academy i love going there figuring something out asking my students for help asking the other coaches for help and it just makes the experience so much better for me today i did a little training with my son got some advice from him coach marcello was there asked him about something he came over and helped me out uh it just puts me in a place of gratitude and in a place of lack of self-consciousness and do you feel like less pressure on yourself like less Absolutely. like yeah less of this image walking in like i'm supposed to be the best one in here and i'm Absolutely. supposed to crush everyone yeah and i'm you know takes like, that off the table i can't even think about it all i think about is jujitsu itself and, and gaining some insights and getting better and acknowledging that i have a lot to work on and i'm not perfect and i feel great about it you know and I pretty much go weekly to sit your tongue in Somerville and do a lesson with crew Mark Delagradi. And I love going there because I love going in and being that blank slate, that student who's ready to learn. And uh, it's just an uh, exciting experience and it's liberating. It feels so free. Right. And so even up at sit your tongue, do you feel like you don't have to worry like, uh, I looked bad here, or, or I, I should don't. Have, I yeah, should have beaten that guy, or that guy got the better of me, or do you just not worry as much about? I try not to, them? and I try not to worry about my mistakes. I re I had an epiphany over there once that oh, I want to make my mistakes in front of my instructor so they could help me improve on my mistakes. If I hide my mistakes, a weird thing happens. One, your actual performance in the moment decreases because <laughs> you're tighter and you're closed up. And you also can't improve because you can't work on your mistakes. You know, we have this culture now that in the United States where we want to focus on the positive all the time. And I, and I think that's fine, but you can also gain a lot of progress in martial arts and jujitsu by just removing your biggest mistake. It's a, it's a little bit like the eating healthy. Like if you remove, basically we're all perfectly healthy, except that we do things to harm our health. And if, if right. you just stop harming right. your health, you're going to get healthier. And you harm your health by eating processed food. And and it's simple, and it's maybe it's easier for you than others, but if a person could just start only eating non-processed natural food, their health would improve dramatically pretty quickly. Uh, so it's it's that idea of like not being afraid of, of making mistakes and trying to fix your mistakes. Uh, yeah. And I think for the beginners in jiu-jitsu, it's one of the first points you you hear, which is, you know, you start rolling or, or stand up, any of these things. You start rolling, and I don't know if you've experienced this a lot with new guys. They're always like, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Like, for you know, mm. for their whole role. Do you know what I mean? Their Very whole, true, Dan. This is like an advanced version of that. Like, mm. the, at the most basic level, they come in and they're like, sorry, am I, oh, did I do the wrong? I'm sorry, should I? And you're, I've, I, so many beginners I've had to say, like, don't just go like you're fine like do you know what I mean That's like very sorry, true so, Dan they're know. actually apologizing for their lack of knowledge yeah when there's no way they could have that knowledge until they come to the academy right it's very it's like the very common is actually. to feel like is to be apologizing like sorry sorry and I've heard like, people go, also good. have this idea Dan that like well I don't want to screw everyone up coming in here being the ignorant lummox yeah, yeah. and it's like no 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 you're here as a student this is all part of the process yeah, that's very interesting, Dan. That's a very common perspective that new students have, and it doesn't serve them at all. And I used to do it for the example for stand-up where I do it was, well, first of all, you see with stand-up too, like 
sometimes it's polite to apologize if you feel like you hit someone too hard. But but I think especially new guys apologize too much. Sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry for the whole the whole bout. <laughs> and then I would do it for even hitting pads. Like it would be like do uh, you know one two three com you know some combination, and I'd screw it up, and then be like oh sorry, and it'd be like some experienced coach. It would be like Steve Whittier or you or I don't know who I hit pads with. And it would sort of feel like, don't apologize. Just keep, just keep going through the drill. Like you it's very tricky when you're learning that because you do want to acknowledge your mistakes so yeah. you can correct them, but you don't want to lose focus in the moment. And also, sometimes yeah. the mistake's obvious though. Like you obviously missed the missed the punch you were supposed right. to do. So just reset and, reset go. and go. Like don't like everyone knows you missed it. You don't like. There's no point in saying, "Oh, I'm sorry." I you know. Mm. It's like just and uh, I think more experience you see guys warming up before bouts or, you know, at the highest level mm. in the world. And they, you know, you'll see them miss the, pe you know, they miss their combination or you'll see the, the coach hold the pad and they they throw the wrong punch or something. And they never stop and say, oh, I'm right. sorry. Like, it's just like, you know, you reset and then you throw again. You just stay in the flow. Yeah. Cool. Well, Dan, I actually wrote notes for this episode. Yeah. Maybe I mean, we, we always we're always over prepared <laughs> that's so, right isn't that a slogan i used to have prepare right right podcast right exactly so i read this book dan it's called the power of agency the power by, of agency agency written by paul knapper and anthony i think his name is rao r-a-o i'll hold it up to the camera here and um i thought it was pretty good i wrote some notes i really enjoyed the book it's called The Seven Principles to Conquer Obstacles, Make Effective Decisions, and Create a Life on Your Own Terms. Conquer obstacles, make, make effective, effective decisions, decisions, conquer life on your and own And create terms. a life. Create a life on your own terms. On your own terms. And I see they have doctorates, which they is have always doctorates. a good sign. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. For that's right. higher level. This one, what does that mean, Danny? Is it a, a doctorate in Side psychology? Deal. PsyD. It's PsyD. Yeah. Well, PhD. You can have a PhD in psychology, and you can have a PsyD in what's psychology. What's What's the difference? PsyD. Uh, I think it may be more clinical. Interesting. Like more interacting with patients. And they got a little guy here with a giant golden key. He's holding over his head. The key to life, maybe. The key to yeah. I would. It looks like an awful big key, though, man. I don't know. Anyways, I wrote some notes, and I think there's some. See. When you when you saw this, what did you think? The power of agency. What did you think this book was about? If you couldn't read the the subtitle, uh, could, than, it's a little yeah. vague, right? It could be like a sports agent. You know what I mean? <laughs> Travel agent. I don't know. So no, when they for say, me, I guess, I guess I I guess I would think what it probably is like being an agent in your own life. Being a, I do like that word agent. Control your yeah. own life. Yeah. Some people use the word free will. I think some people use the concept of willpower. Some think we don't have free will. You know, the same Harris types, these new atheists say we have no free will. We're running around like uh, machines. Yeah, although what do you sometimes think? it just becomes a semantic argument. Where yeah? like, I'm sure Sam Harris would maybe agree with a lot of these points if they're good points. And so I, I never got the free will argument because it seems semantic or abstract to me. It's like, do we have free will or not? Seems. I think we have agency, so we have a certain capacity that gets diminished or can't expand based on probably our habits and what we do. And I think this book sort of addresses that. So, like, the number one note I have it is, number one, cut down background noise where you can in your environment. Declutter. And I, I find this super helpful for me. When I teach a class, I, I can't have any music playing. You know what I mean? I f it seems common today that people want music going on all the time. Or if you go someplace, the TV is playing, a dentist office or something. You yeah. know what I mean? Bar room, whatever. We've all changed in that way. Like even you and I. Mm -hmm. If we are sitting, waiting, f waiting at a bar for someone to meet us, we'll have our phone out mm. and watch. Right? Like there's no such thing anymore of just sitting still. But right. if you do want to get something done, the less clutter, the less distraction you have, the better, right? Yeah. 
I started to declutter my whole home and my office because that is a weakness that I have. I get a little uh, disheveled. So yeah. I think I have good ideas. A lot of people do. Good intentions. Yeah. <laughs> Relatively smart guy, but I start to get disheveled. And, and it occurred to me this year that if I could declutter, I, that one thing could only help me be more effective, Dan. What do you think? Right. So we're talking about physical decluttering. Right I think now, physical which is a big thing, and I, I'm a big fan of it. Like, yeah. I, I never let a room in my house or even like an attic anywhere, a drawer, go too long before I'm like, let's pull a closet. You get the drawers done. I pull everything out. And, I thought the and, drawers were to hide the clutter. And then you have to make like a hard decision where you're like things, because that's where people get stuck. They'll be that's like- That's the whole Marie Kondo thing, yeah, right? Yeah. If this, something I, doesn't I, I, bring I you joy, throw it out. Yeah, I mean, it, and again, it depends how you do it. Sometimes it's silly, but yeah. like, you know, because a lot of, a lot of things don't bring me joy, but like my old tax returns don't bring me joy, but they I'm don't. not going to throw them out. So it's sort of like... At some point, you can throw them out. What is it, 10 years or something? Yeah, when they stop bringing me joy <laughs> at 10 years. But there's lots of things that, you know, you can't be like, yeah, this painting, this... Yeah, I don't know. This thing from my wedding doesn't bring me joy. It goes in the garbage. You know what I mean? Like you're sort of, you have to... This wedding al album, ah, I don't even look at it garbage. Like I get, like, it's not that easy. Right, but I think people in general err too way too far in the other direction where they're like, uh, you know, this umbrella. I remember we bought this umbrella when I was in Paris, and let's keep it. And it's Dan, like, I've oh, never we, purchased we an umbrella in my life. Did you know that? Yeah, I don't want to get a sidetrack, but I don't <laughs> think guys should have umbrellas. I don't think so. I, or I've used never them. owned one or had one. Or ever. You, I don't even. I admit I've used them under but protest, I, but I don't think you should. No. Very I mean, unmanly. You just suck it up and you walk in the rain. You look like Mary Poppins walking around with yeah, her umbrella. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're going to get a few drops of water on you? Exactly. On. Yeah. Are you going to twirl it and or dance with it? Like you shouldn't. Yeah. I think just walk in the rain like a man. Get wet. Like a man. Right? <laughs> exactly. Like that scene. It's like a parasol. Up. Like should have a fringe yeah. on it. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? You can't use an umbrella. But that's neither here nor there. Okay. What I was saying is like, you can be like, I'm not going to throw out this broken umbrella because I remember when we bought it in Paris. It's like, no, you got to throw out the umbrella. Like, So mm. I think people err too far on that side where they're like, oh, wait, but I remember this thing. Mm. So I want to keep it. And you have to be like, it doesn't matter if you remember it or, you know, like re realistically, do you need it or not? And I agree Now, let me ask you a question, Dan. Stuff. Do you make your bed in the morning? I've Yeah, the last couple of years. There was some YouTube video of some gung ho guy. You know, I think it was like, a Navy admiral at a commencement speech. Yeah, being like, "Make your bed for da 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 da." And I, I still feel like it's, <laughs> I still feel like it's way over exaggerated. Like that speech, like oh, you know what I mean? Totally. Like it's like, yeah. yeah, if you make your bed, you can. And I'm like, yeah, you know, look, it doesn't really matter that much if you make your bed, but there's some little there's thing something to it. To it. There's I, I think it's about it. this decluttering. Yeah, and I started to do it myself. And I've started, you know, I watched um, Bill Gates. They have a Netflix documentary about him. Yeah. Have you seen it? I didn't see it. It's in my queue. It's an my, interesting uh, guy, man. List. So brilliant and so intense and tremendous reader. But they show him sitting down to read. And he's sitting down this big wooden table. It's looking over his backyard or something, just some trees and nature out the window. And there's nothing else on the table but the book he's reading mm -hmm. and maybe a pen and paper. That's it. And the room, when you look around, there might be some books on a shelf, but it's pretty sparse. And I think it's designed so he can focus on this book and figuring out what it has to offer him and thinking. That's it. So he doesn't have a pile of yeah. five books and his good luck charm here and a pencil sharpener and all this bullshit and nonsense in front of him. And I think it's, it's just a decluttering thing. Yeah. And you never, you never regret it. Like once you throw a bunch of this stuff out, you're never like, oh, I really wish I didn't throw out that umbrella. You know what I mean? You're always like, once it's gone, you're always like, actually, yeah, I don't care that it's gone. You know what I mean? Like totally agree. once you make that call, once you're able to get yourself to do it. Yes. And I think this goes along with the healthy eating. If I declutter my house of 
food except for the food that's healthy for me to eat, it's so much easier. Yeah, That's what I've done pretty much at our house. So if it's 11 o'clock at night and I suddenly want to have a slice of pizza or I get a hankering for something and I don't have it, there's not a lot I can do about it. Yeah, And luckily, like you, I'm too embarrassed to get in my car and, and go yeah, get yeah, it. That's too much. Yeah. That's too much. So then I don't eat it. And, and I wake up and I've forgotten all about it the next day. Like most of those pangs and those cravings, they have a uh, a time. Yeah, like five uh, minutes, right? Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. Because I've had that. Like when I was searching for the sugar through the drawers and like, you know, I don't know, screaming, breaking things, <laughs> like looking through looking through the house. In five minutes, if you can't find anything, you're like, all right. Screw it. Yeah, screw yeah, it's it. gone. Yeah, screw it. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. So number two in the power of agency, design living and working spaces to appeal to your five senses. All five? I don't know. I just wrote down what they wrote. <laughs> now that I wrote I agree- these notes probably a month ago or so, Dan, and I, I did that thing that I typically do. I read the book. Uh dog-eared pages, wrote down some notes. I was all yeah. set for this podcast. I put this on my kitchen counter, went out the door, left it behind. Right. And we've also... Oh, you, you know why? Because my goddamn kitchen was so cluttered yeah, exactly. that I didn't even see the stupid thing. Exactly. So if, but, now that I'm decluttering even my kitchen, a, another, I remembered the notes today. Another benefit of the podcast, other than improving all aspects of your life, is you get to hear... Books like that, you know, right. books that are distilled for you. Distilled. The essence of them. Yeah. So, so all, well, I'm sure, again, I, I'm just kidding because I'm sure the author knows it's not all five senses and all. Well, you can't have a place that smells bad. That's for sure. Well, right? you, have a, you run a jujitsu gym. I'm not <laughs> sure it's always. Well, that's a good point, Dan. I guess it, it depends on what, what you're trying to room. get to. Right, yeah. Have you designed the locker room to be like, I love the but smell. But it's nice if you have a nice looking room, right? Yeah. Like I like my kitchen now. It's been renovated. It's uh it's nice looking. So I like it when I'm working in there yeah. and doing something. Um all right, let's I think we should move on. What do you think? From the from the five senses. I mean we get the idea. Yeah, what are you looking? The ideas I'd what made, are you yeah, licking the table? Try to get <laughs> yeah, exactly taste. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, your workspace is taste, really. But we get the idea. Okay. I'm sure. Again, we're kidding because I'm sure the author's like, "Look, I I get it." Yeah. Okay. Number three, boredom is good. It stimulates creativity. So, um, I heard Neil Gaiman, the author. Are you familiar with him? I am. Very very cool fantasy author. author. I yeah. I don't know what's his most famous. What is his most famous thing? I think they just well. I've they have a TV show on stuff. Netflix, uh, American Gods. He right, wrote that. Right. It's pretty cool. There's another show that, out that that he just they just released. There's it one, but they're all, they're hard to remember the names because it's, it's like Otherworld and you know stuff like yeah. that where you can't quite remember the name or like Underground. You know, like you can't quite. Right. The one I enjoyed was the Graveyard Book. Yeah, that was like a kid's book, but like more fun. Very for, cool. Yeah. And he released an audio version where he recorded it himself. Just brilliant. Yeah, I've listened graveyard to book. It's a quick read. Anyone yeah. out there wants a three-day read? Very cool. If you want to listen to it, I think it's six hours, yeah. but it's cool. If, you get, if you're get if you driving to New York or something, throw it on. So Neil Gaiman said that's how he writes, is he, you need to have, he needs to have boredom. So in other words, you've heard this story where some people, if, if they, to deal with writer's block, they go and rent a hotel room someplace, something, right. get out of their house. But he said you can't go to the Four Seasons. You know what I mean? Right. You, and or just Acapulco have a vacation yeah. that doesn't work. You actually got to go someplace that's not interesting. And it's sort of like the whole decluttering thing. So he's decluttering everything so there's nothing to, to entertain himself with. It's an interesting thought to even if you're writing at home to be like take everything off the desk. Like the Bill right. Gates example where you're like don't even have – well, you might feel like, who cares if there's a pile of papers and some pens? Right. Like, just move it yeah. so you have nothing to look at. Right. Because your brain will start distracting distracting you as hard as it can. It'll be like, oh, what's that? Is that pen from from Maine? You know, like, you know, it'll, you'll start looking around. and We have so many ways to distract ourselves today with our phones yeah. and everything. It's, it's a little disturbing. Yeah, and of course, put the phones away. 
Yeah, if you want to write. Yeah, you can play on your phone. You can watch Netflix. You can stream things. And then if you're writing on the computer, you know, All right. you're Surf one click away you from anything. YouTube forever. Yeah. You go out drinking. Uh, all these distractions. Play Web Sudoku. That's what I. That's what I do. You can drink and play Web Yoku. Sudoku. Yeah. Uh, but you know what can happen? Years can go by. Yeah. <laughs> and you can get nothing done. So uh, I got to do that more. I got to declutter, sit down in some boredom, so I can create. So I think that's. And then a good I one. originally thought if there's a uh, a more abstract idea of declutter of decluttering your mind yeah right like not just the pencils off the table mm. but like that your thoughts you know yeah. if you can try to stop thinking about every scenario and every you know i've developed a habit of i'm almost constantly listening to some podcast or, or another and it seems great because oh getting this great information but it almost becomes this weird habit that your brain wants this background conversation going while you're cleaning your house or doing whatever the hell you're doing driving your car and it doesn't give your mind that quiet time to actually think which i think right. is important yeah i could imagine your brain sort of getting used to the quiet times being filled with some sort of yeah literal noise right yeah. like definitely i used to have this is sort of a maybe a stretch of a uh, comparison but i don't know if you ever played any video game for too long and then your brain starts seeing reality oh. in terms of that video game. The, the typical the one is uh, Tetris, mm. where like people would say like you'd sit in class and you'd start picturing dropping <laughs> shapes down, like in front of like well I I could fit a, a square next to the teacher and then next I could to put their one head up. yeah next to the <laughs> head and and I used to play like in high school and college like uh, sort of Mario Brothers types game where you're running across the screen. And then I go to class and I'd sit there and my brain would instantly like I'd look up at the board and be like, you got I, could, Mario I could jump. Yeah, something. I could just be like I could jump. I could go chair, table <laughs> to cross the, the chalkboard and out the window. You know, what I mean, like I like my brain would see it. Yeah. In terms of like that video game. So you can really affect your the way your brain is Definitely. seeing reality based on. So I'm not surprised at all if you're listening to podcasts all the time, your brain will quickly adjust and be like, where's the noise? Like, where's mm -hmm. the. Where's the sound? Where's the voices? And then the sad part of it is I'm not really taking in the information <laughs> if I'm doing that way. And okay. I really quickly about reading. Yeah. I think that I, there's a bad sign where, you know, I feel like I used to be like, let, I'm going to spend the day reading, okay. reading on the beach or reading by the pool or just, Love the, doing that. Read, but uh, I feel like I can't read as long as I used to. Huh. Like I'll either start getting tired or I'll be like, I can't just keep reading. Like, I don't know if I can read. I don't know if I could read 100 pages in a row now. You know what I mean? Of fiction or nonfiction, Dan? I think either one. Either one. I got in the habit of when I went home for lunch, reading a chapter while I was sitting in the sun. I found that pretty enjoyable. But you're right. I would only read one chapter. I think I used to be able to read more. Oh, yeah. I think so. How were your eyes? How's your eyesight? Uh... Yeah, fine. Fine. You're an alien. Yeah, <laughs> mine's failing. But if I'm outside in the sun, I, I, it's fine. All right. Number four, Dan. Spend time with the right people. This is going to improve your agency. That's why I'm here with you and Dimitri, man, every week. But it's also tricky because that's a, you have to define right people and figure out who are the right people. That is That is correct. So... What do you think these authors mean by spend time with the right people? I honestly almost don't want to get into it because I think we can have at least a whole podcast talking about. It's something we've talked a lot off the air about, about disagreeable people. Disagreeable and people. And then I was thinking more about it, how there's like levels of what do you mean by a disagreeable person and how you should treat that person. So it might be the whole next we week's whole, podcast we or something like because there's – well, the, well it's on that, the bell curve, right? So. Because a lot of people know this. They're like, you hear all the time, like, get bad people out of your life. and But they mean it the most blatant, you know, it's like the alcoholic who's abusing you, get Throwing them out of your life. Throwing a bottle at your head. Yeah, the, it's yeah. like, well, yeah, yeah, get that person out of your Definitely. life. Like, so that's mostly what people mean when you hear that, like, get this horrible person out of your life. But there's layers to it. And there's people that aren't horrible that still should be 
there's the sneaky horrible people yeah. who are passive aggressive and yeah. give you back yeah. compliments and, and then really there's other people want who nothing but the I, worst I would for honestly you. say aren't even horrible but you don't really need them in your life like mm. you don't you know they're not helping you they're not so and so there's levels of this there's, there's levels. levels and then and then some people should be cut completely out of your life and some people should be some people have this in your life this like idea you know, and that family is so important <laughs> So they have these maniacs as family members, and they're like, yeah, but they're family. Yeah. I've come to the conclusion that we should hold family members to a higher standard of behavior than non-family members. Because you, you have a biological tendency to give them the benefit of the doubt. Right. So if they're knuckleheads and screwing you over, you're more likely to take it. This is all hypothetical, you're saying. <laughs> exactly. You're for someone else. Right, exactly. <laughs> You've yeah. just thought about this for other family. Right. No, it's the truth. I hold my family to a higher yeah. standard than strangers. Is it fair to say, do they? Do you have family members that listen to the podcast? Some do. Uh, I think my brother listens, but you know he's living up to the standard, so he's <laughs> passing gonna... muster. I don't know if I'm passing muster with him, though. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's going to listen to this and be like, wait a minute. <laughs> okay, Got right, it. people. All right, let's move on then. So we're, Dan, we might get through all seven of these. All so right. number five is... Say no to situations that pull you down. Say no to situations that pull you down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. another think, one of those things. Like, I what does I, that mean? I think yeah. I always have, right? I mean, I don't know. I'm, I guess, yeah, I haven't been, I don't, I think it's fair to say I haven't been a terrible follower in my life, so. Right. I, you know what I mean? You I avoided feel like all I the cult have, Yeah, I don't feel like I've had too much trouble with that. But I guess a lot of people do. It probably goes back to that agreeable, disagreeable thing. When people who are super highly agreeable, they get roped into all kinds of nuttiness that pulls them down. I think I've pulled other people down. <laughs> that, does that count? Does that count as... Uh, you know, people... That doesn't should, count. Maybe no, you can pull other no people down. Yeah, no, yeah, that's different. That's so it's it. fine to pull other people down. That's it. <laughs> okay. Okay, number six. This is all to increase your power of agency. <clears throat> Use your imagination to create powerful images of the self-prevailing. Use your imagination to picture yourself prevailing. Is that what it's saying? I think that's what it's, that's what it's so saying. So we've talked about that quite a bit for, uh, for MMA and jiu-jitsu, right? Like yeah. It's positive imagery. Yeah. Picture yourself doing well. That's also a crazy one. Like you said, um, the first time you mentioned this to me years ago, it was sort of, it was about passing guard. Mm. And th you'd say to yourself, like, I'm the best guard passer. No one can stop my guard pass. And it would actually help. Definitely. And it would actually, and it, I thought it was helpful too. Mm. It, it sort of subtly, you must be actually moving differently or putting different energy in. You know what it is? <clears throat> That's very interesting, Dan, that you should bring this up because I was listening to a podcast because I'm a maniac. I listen to them constantly. I think I was listening to maybe Jordan Peterson and they were, and he was interviewing a neuroscientist. And you may know this, but I didn't really understand this before. But I think they were suggesting that 25% of our neurons in our brain and nervous system are inhibiting neurons. So mm -hmm. they're stopping us from doing stuff. So a lot of our behavior is releasing that inhibition, and then we just do what's in there automatically. Right. I mean, you need inhibiting neurons, right? You need. Oh, you definitely you know, need them. You wouldn't have them if we didn't need them. Like when things aren't being inhibited properly. And but I guess what I'm saying is maybe that that positive self-talk or that positive imagination allows you to let go of some of that inhibition that's actually holding you back. Yeah. So it's so we're not coming at at some activity with a blank slate and we're just doing something. We're actually we got up one foot on the gas and one foot on the brake. And maybe through some of this, you know, these powerful images, you take your foot off the brake a little bit. Right. And because I like I remember when you said that like my first thought being a skeptic was I sort of felt like, well, I can't sit there saying I'm the best guard passer in the world because I know I'm not right. that good at guard passing. You know, right. I mean? like, 
But that's not the point of it, right? Like the point is, we all know you're not the best guard passer in the world. The point is, there's an effect. There's a tangible effect to you saying that to yourself. Definitely. It's not like, oh, you're literally the, you know, we all get that. But it's like, just saying that to yourself, you know, whatever the mechanism, if it's working, it's working. Here's right? another thing, Dan, that I think is really important about doing something successfully. Let's take jujitsu. What will happen is if you try to pass somebody's guard, like say you're trying to pass my guard, I'm a mm -hmm. black belt, I'm giving you a hard time. If you have that experience enough times without succeeding, you'll start to develop an image and a belief that you cannot pass my guard. Right. And, and my hypothesis is once that image and that, I, that belief is strong enough, you'll completely inhibit yourself and you will not be able to pass my guard. Right. Well, I've been there for so sure. We're like, what is the point? Like, why, why, yeah. why do I even continue this role? I cannot pass. You right. Know? And part of the, the way forward is to create that image first of you do, succeeding and yeah. passing the guard. So I think you have to create the image first in order to start to create the belief. Some of it's probably just it. energy, right? Like as opposed to like, oh, I can't do it. It's so different than I'm going to or telling yourself. I'm yeah, well, I think when you feel like you can't and you have that image of you not being able to do it, you probably turn on all your inhibitory neurons. So you're, you're just not going to put in the same effort and you're not going to attempt it. and You're going to hesitate. So you, you can't take advantage of any brief opportunity that opens up. So you, you got to lean way hard the other way. Even if you really can't pass, you at least give yourself an, a chance to have your best effort. Right. And I think jujitsu or these kind of jujitsu is a great example for where that would work maybe the, better than so. any, because sort of like a hundred yard dash, maybe that helps you a little, but you're still going to, I mean, it can help you only so much run. You know what well, I mean? I think, like, yeah. So once you have something that has so few variables, but that's what I'm saying. Jiu-Jitsu yeah. has so many variables yeah. that it might help more than anything else I can think of. I think a lot because of things in you, life are like that, but yeah. you're right. Yeah. Yeah, but also with physicality, it helps because also if you're like, I'm going to write the best novel in the world, but you're not a good writer. You know what I mean? Like you can't, it only is going to help so much. I agree. You know? so, I agree. So jiu-jitsu is a great example for it. Well, what is it going to do, Dan? It's going to get you closer to your potential in the moment. You know what I mean? It's not magic. It's not yeah. going to make you twice as strong as you were, or twice as fast, or twice as good. But it's going to allow you to get your closer to your hundred percent of what you have. Yeah. Where most most of us are walking around at a seven yeah. out of ten. We're yeah. only getting seventy yeah. percent out of what we have. So I think that's what it is. So it isn't magic, but in a way, it is magic. You know, yeah. getting to your potential. <laughs> you know, I have this mantra that I advise my students to use particularly when they're stuck in the bottom of a bad position. So this isn't the same as images. This is mantra. This is self-talk. Yeah. Is it, so, I'll never get out of here because I've tried that. It doesn't, I'll tell you right now, that one's not effective. That didn't work out? No, I, uh, I can't breathe is another one that doesn't work. Well, we'll check that off. That's fine. Okay. It's all data. It's <laughs> all, right, all good yeah. information. That doesn't work. So the one that works is I'm stuck under a mount, under a good jujitsu player. I say to myself, I'm in control. I'm in control. So I'm emphasizing that it's me who is in control, not the person on top of me in mount. Yeah. And control is good because a feeling of lack of control stimulates a stress response and you know gets us all worked up. We can't think straight. And this yeah. type of thing. And another example from beginner jiu-jitsu, and we've all seen this, is uh, beginner, uh, beginner players that tap out from panic basically from being mm. just tap out from mount. right tap out from side control right without you know, being like, so can't. you're saying they're tapping out without a submission hold applied yes. without a, a strangulation applied they just freak and out we've all seen it by now right yeah. many many times a lot of people have done and sometimes that. big guys even like yep. and they'll be sort of they'll tap out from me just having side control yeah and like i couldn't breathe or i couldn't and that's all that stress response right I mean, exactly and the reality is they could breathe and yeah. they were perfectly fine, but their sense of being out of control became overwhelming from their stress response, right. so they had to tap. Because so. more experienced people never tap out from that. And I've even had, or, or close to never, because I've had, even after some experience, that panicky feeling of like, wait, I can't get my breath. Like, 
Yeah. You know what I mean, you know, like well, if I had you're a f- going very hard and then someone big is on you and you feel like, wait, I can't breathe. I think two or three years ago, probably three years ago now, I was doing uh, some training with Carlos Crespo, one of our black belts. Yeah. And uh, so what we did is we had the situation where I started and I allowed him to take my gi lapel and like wrap my arm up. So almost like my arm mm-hmm. is in a sling, put it around my head. So I couldn't move one of my arms. And then he went to mount. So now I'm stuck under mount. And he's got his legs under my legs. I can't pin this arm. And I started to have a stress response, Dan. I started... like a, Almost like a claustrophobia. I, yeah, like a panic. Because I yeah. couldn't move properly and I was out of control. I'm like, here I'm doing this stuff for 17 years at yeah. that point. <laughs> and, and I'm having a stress response. And I wanted to... I didn't tap, Dan. Yeah. But I wanted to. Yeah. And I felt like I couldn't breathe. But I could breathe. But I had that a, a sufficient sense of not having control that... I, I, I started to have that stress response. So right. I was in and class. 17 years in. 17 years. Yeah. So it can happen to yeah. anybody. It's just, it's a natural phenomenon. So I was in class and one of the students, I think it was Tyrell Anderson, he, he asked me, what do you do when you're in the bottom in this situation? And I said, I told them that mantra, I'm in control, I'm in control. So I don't know, it was a week later, another student who was in our class, Alex Rose, he said, you know, I've been using that mantra and it works great. I feel so much better. And he said, I'm actually using it outside of the academy. Yeah. So he's yeah. a firefighter, I think, in Norwood. And he said, yeah, I was like trying to read a book, study, and I was losing focus. And I said to myself, I'm in control. I'm in control. Mm. And I could stay focused and I could finish my reading. I thought that was amazing, huh? Yeah. That should be in the book. That mantra would give you more <laughs> yeah. agency. Uh, so yeah, I was picturing I, him also with a hose, like some big blaze and being like, I'm in control. Like, <laughs> but he was using it for work. reading a book, Dan. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So I got to, it's one of these typical things where you, as an instructor, you have this great advice and you forget to use it yourself, you know? Well, that's the thing. And you will again. So we've said that before, like it, it's hard. Like you, you, all this advice we give, you might go in and have a day where you forget to do any of it, right? Like forget to do any of it. Yeah. And so it's hard. You always have to keep reminding yourself because I had all these mantras. I forget to I forget them. Forget you know, them. so that's another thing is like. How do you remind yourself? You know, how do you probably get to come up with a checklist that I should put together that I look at before I step on the mat every time? Maybe everyone could do that, especially because it's real easy. You could just glance at it, you know? Yeah. Um. Okay, the seventh one is similar to the sixth. The seventh note here is use guided imagery practice to visualize yourself achieving. Right. I think that's helpful. So that's kind of what you're saying. If you don't, if you, if I can't visualize myself passing some guy's guard, I'm pro- if I can't visualize myself doing it, I'm probably visualizing myself not doing it. Yeah. Right. It's probably not neutral. Right. right. And that definitely works. And I know there's accomplished UFC fighters. I think most of them, they like to go in to the cage before, like the day before their fight. Right. And they run around the cage, like with their Mm. arms raised. And, Mm. and some of it's practical to like feel, feel, Mm. you know, get a feel for it. But some of it is, they always talk about that visualization, right? Like picture yourself winning, picture your hand being raised, the whole Mm. thing. Yeah. If you can't do that, you, you probably don't have a chance. You're probably going to completely inhibit yourself. But you made the good point is it's not magic. It's not going to make you a, 10 times better than you are, yeah. but it's going to allow you to approach your 100%, yeah. which realistically, we probably don't approach our 100% performance. You're not going to hurt. You know, you're not you know, going to do worse. It's going to help for yeah. sure. I got to do more of it. Um, so that was a good book, Dan. And it didn't take me long to read it. I think those are all... The power of agency. Power of agency. And it is not helping you become an agent. No, it's giving you more that. power in your life. I think I told you my theory, my hypothesis of will of free will. I think we have all these different factors that affect our behavior. And free will is some slice of the pie of it. If we look at a pie chart and we put in all the factors that affect our behavior, one tiny slice of it is free will. So you're saying a big slice is how you're genes. raised, your genetics, your environment. I think your genes parents are probably fifty percent yeah. of the pie, and then how you were raised, you know, what you're eating, Friends, nutrition, luck, all this yeah. kind of stuff goes in. And then, right, 
And one thin, thin slice of that pie is free will. But we can expand that slice of the pie. And probably part of it is decluttering, eating healthy. Like if you get healthy, you can act with free will, right? If, if you're not addicted to sugar, I mean, when you were tearing apart your kitchen looking for sugar, yeah. you weren't acting with free will at that point, right? <laughs> you're acting like yeah, a yeah. maniac. Yeah. Uh, so that's the opposite of free will, right? That's a free will. Yeah. Your th- slice of the free will pie was pretty thin no, at so that So we point. talk on here too about getting healthy or losing weight or this mm. stuff, but that's sort of a cornerstone of a lot of, you know what I mean? Like there's a lot of people of that are right? not, it's hard to be like in a very, I, I mean, I guess there, it's possible, but you know, a very happy together place and feeling bad about your health. You know what I mean? Like it's, yeah. it's, it's health is sort of number one, right? I think it's, it's fundamental. Yeah, definitely. So Dan, I think we're, we're just about wrapped it up. Yeah. And you just summarized. So I think we're in good shape. We're good. Um, Maybe next week will be, what was the point we were going to come back to? Oh, unpleasant people. Oh, right. Disagreeable. Disagreeable people. Disagreeable, unpleasant, and negative people in your life. Uh, I've been spotting them now like aliens in the invasion of the body snatchers. When I see them, yeah. boom, I peg them now. And uh, yeah, I All deal right. with them accordingly. Yeah, Maybe we'll talk about next that week. next week. Sounds good. Awesome. Thank you again, Dan, for another brilliant sure. podcast. Thank you, Dimitri. Thanks to all our listeners, people who like and share our podcast. And uh, tell your friends about it. And we will talk to you soon. Take care.